here uh, Dr. Arlorn from uh, the U.S. Army Research Lab in, uh, uh, in Maryland. Uh, Dr. Lauren received his PhD in uh, mathematical statistics from Florida State University in Tallahassee uh, under the uh, supervision of Dr. Wei Wu. Uh, he focused on the development of uh, statistical models for motor cortex neural activity and in uh, brain machine interface development for neuroprosthetic control for artificial limbs. From uh, 2011 to 2014, he was uh, a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Texas in the Army Research Lab, and uh, where he uh, worked on uh, different uh, uh, ways of attacking the problem, namely machine learning and statistical modeling techniques for EEG this time, EEG signal uh, processing and large data scale analysis. He's been uh, with the uh, U.S. Army Research Lab since uh, 2014, where he is uh, a mathematical statistician in the Human Research and Engineering Group, and uh, his research interests uh, span a wide area of, uh, of statistics, machine learning, neuroscience, and, uh, and of course, like all of us, he's interested in developing new algorithms for, and, uh, for neurotechnologies and human brain interface. And with that, uh, thank you for coming, and the floor is yours. All right, uh, first off, I'd like to thank Dr. Krim for the invitation. Um, so today I'll be talking mainly about some of the research programs that we have under, underway at ARL in terms of translational neuroscience for human machine systems. So how do we use neuroscience concepts to help design more novel ways of interacting with technology? I'll have to apologize up front. I, I set up this talk to be probably a little bit too basic for some of the audience that I've already met, but it should be... Uh, a general enough tutorial so that everybody can uh, can get something out of the talk. Um, also, um, if there's in, at points in the talk where I talk about statistics or mathematical theory, I'm just going to do what any good speaker will do and gloss over the details. But if there's any um, if there's any uh, particular questions about that, I'm happy to to address those. So before we get into the actual research, uh, I think it's helpful to talk about uh, the status of global neuroscience over the last several years. Um, so this started off this global initiative. It started several years ago with then President Obama uh, signing off on the Brain Initiative. So this was an, an ambitious effort uh, at up to $100 million a year to scale up to $5 billion total by 2025. This is a, a U.S.-based initiative to focus on neurotechnologies, both for the medical research as well as, uh, hum as the healthy populations. And so similar research initiatives can be seen. Uh, the next one came from Japan, the, the Brain Minds Project. Um, f following suit was uh, the European effort on the Human Brain Project, as well as uh, some smaller initiatives from the Allen Institute for Brain Science and from, uh, from South Korea. And so this represents a really large global effort to understand uh, neuroscience and how we can use uh, these concepts to designing better uh, neural technologies. Um, also very recently, I believe within the last year, the IEEE professional societies has, have also sort of come on board uh, using their ex expertise in engineering, uh, signal processing to help facilitate this uh, global research initiative. So. It's been several years since the start of many of these projects, and there have been many uh, successes to report uh, from each of them. However, at ARL, what we're primarily focused on is how do we translate these neuroscience concepts from the bench to the battlefield? So this is actually a somewhat older slide. Um, so it should be probably more than one million citable documents in, in neuroscience over the last 15 years. But the general uh, purpose is, is the same in that there's been a rapid proliferation of understanding of the nervous system and how it relates to behavior. However, it's widely acknowledged that um, these, uh, these advances have had difficulty in translating to basic uh, technological concepts. And so this requires a solution that uh, requires us to go from 
the laboratory into the real world. And so there are significant um, technological as well as um, scientific uh, questions surrounding the transition from outside of the lab and into the real world. And so at ARL, we primarily focus on creating and executing a capability that takes concepts of translational neuroscience uh, from the laboratory into uh, viable technologies that can potentially provide revolutionary solutions for the Army. And so th the key challenge is uh, you have two different kinds of processors. One is the human, and we all know that humans have a remarkable ability to adapt to uh, unforeseen uh, en environments, and this capability currently far outstrips machine capabilities. However, as we may all know, um, humans have their uh, fallbacks. They sometimes get fatigued or their performance level may not be at 100%. However, technology can actually fill that gap pretty nicely. So technological advances over the last several years have now allowed these systems to process large amounts of data uh, without fatigue or moments of inattention. And so the key technological challenge is trying to connect these two powerful processes together. So take the advantages that humans have in processing information in dynamic environments and combine them with just the speed and pure efficiency of machines. And so we believe that the human system performance, so the human interacting with the technology, is not necessarily limited by uh, the computing power, but it's more about a limitation of the system understanding the human as they're using the technology. So we're focusing on technological uh, uh, technological advances that help facilitate this communication in a more naturalistic fashion. And so by translational neuroscience, I don't necessarily mean in the medical domain where we're restoring uh, lost capability to patients that are suffering uh, from physical injury. What I'm talking about is in a healthy population. So that's a clear distinction that I hope um, has come through. Um, so our primary objective is the creation of novel neurotechnologies that use uh, not just brain signals, but also neuro or biophysiological signals in order to improve the soldier performance by exploiting the natural synergies that exist between humans and technology. So when we talk about translational neuroscience, uh, you can broadly cut the, um, the research program that we have into three different uh, sections. One is focused on brain structure and function. So can we use uh, information regarding individuals' unique uh, structural connectivity, for example, to design targeted technologies that exploit their uniqueness? Uh, on the real-world neuroimaging side, this is more of the hardware development how do you develop robust systems that can be worn outside the laboratory? And this also involves novel signal processing algorithms that allow you to extract the relevant information um, when, there's a, when you're in noisy environments. And then the work that I will be talking about mostly today is on the brain-computer interaction technology side. So developing uh, technologies that exploit neural signals to design uh, novel uh, technologies. And so for those in the audience who don't know what a BCI is, uh, here's a pretty generic definition of a BCI. And it's a mechanism that allows communication with a machine via brain signals. So this bypasses the normal way that we would interact with technology. For example, me just typing on this computer right now. How do you bypass that using technology, um, using measurements of neural activity, and the, the measurement that we mainly focus on here is on EEG, or electroencephalography. And so, for those of you who don't know what EEG is, uh, here's a quick one slide overview of what it is. And so electroencephalography measures the summed activity of large neuronal ensembles at the cortical surface. So at the, at the cortical surface, you have these neurons that kind of look like pyramids. These are called pyramidal cells. And these cells are always oriented perpendicular to the cortical surface. 
And so the activity of a single neuron is at a, at a resolution of tens of millivolts. So this is a signal that's pretty hard to capture, um, especially when the signal has to propagate through multiple layers of, of multiple layers of the head. And so what we instead record is essentially the synchronous activity of thousands, potentially millions of neurons within a cortical patch. So if you have, if all the neurons sort of fire in synchrony, it creates what you, what you can model as a dipole field. It's a sound electrical signal that propagates out from the patch and it gets attenuated at multiple layers of the, of the, of the skull and, and, the, and the scalp. And so this, these layers of attenuation, especially the skull and the scalp, actually severely uh, degrade the, the signal quality. So this is a signal that's not, it does not necessarily do, um, it does not record necessarily the activity at an exact region in the brain, but it records a global average, so to speak, of the activity across the whole, across the whole brain. And so how you record EEG is there's a standard template that, um, that you can use as an atlas for the lo electrode locations. So here is an example of what uh, an EEG recording system looks like. You have here 64 little um, electrodes. They're connected via a, uh, a recording strip to a, a little box that's connected to the wall. Um, so typically you use electroconductive gel that's placed on the surface of the scalp to enhance the electrode contact. So you can imagine being very encumbered. I have to wear a cap. I have to have some gel put on. I can't move around very freely. Um, however, there are some technological advances in dry wireless systems that is enabling us to move outside of the laboratory. So I actually brought some of the sensors that we've been developing over the last several years. Um, for example, um, the one that's right here, this is an electroconductive fabric wrapped around in foam. So you guys can actually just play with that here. Uh, um, we also have these spring-loaded electrodes. So they have little pins that kind of move um, so that it can cut through the hair a little bit easier. Um, what, what's also not listed here is some of these electrodes. These are silver silicon composite material uh, wrapped in carbon black for improved rigidity. And so all, the goal of any of these sensors is to remove the gel and the wire to try to enhance the, uh, the signal quality that you can record. So we can go ahead and just pass those around. I'll need every one of those back, by the way. They're, go they're government property. Um, right, so if you're wondering what, e what, what an EEG signal would look like, this is what, what comes out. So it's a time series. Every row corresponds to one of the locations that you put on the scalp and in time measures the voltage. This is on a scale of microvolts. Um, so it's still a really hard signal to, to measure. Um, an important thing to note is that for most EEG signals of interest, when you're designing technologies around EEG, you're typically looking at a signal whose SNR is less than one. So this is a challenging problem both on machine learning as well as signal processing. How do you detect a signal that's actually buried underneath the noise? Such, DB? Yeah. Uh, I believe this should be at like 10 dB. Yeah, but I have to double check. Um, so this is a challenging problem that requires solutions from multiple areas, from engineering and signal processing to hardware acquisition to machine learning to, to statistics and modeling. So the existing applications of BCI technologies has mainly been in uh, the medical domain, and it, the goal is to restore functionality to physically disabled patients. Um, for example, for epilepsy monitoring, or in the case of spelling, which, let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, so the goal of this kind of system is for people who are paralyzed from the neck down, like they suffer from tetraplegia. Uh, the goal is to try to enhance their interaction with the environment through a display that allows them to spell words. So. Here, the goal is the, the person would focus on the letter that they want to spell, 
a sequence of flashes appears, which the goal of the system is to de decode the letter that they were focused on based off the sequence of flashes. Um, a system like this is not 100% accurate. For example, here it misspells the Z uh, in, in pizza. And then you'll see uh, the last letter come up, and it's, it should be correct with the letter A. So this is a system that uses the visual evoked response to try to, uh, to enhance the person's ability to interact with, with the environment. Um, other applications include uh, direct control of neuroprosthetic limbs, so either using EEG or uh, muscle recordings from the shoulder. Um, also, um, also for control of, uh, of wheelchairs. Um, however, in the last couple years, there's been an increase of interest uh, in the healthy population. So how do we use these concepts to, in, a, in the healthy case, or in a healthy subject case, to provide some additional, um, some additional uh, capability? Uh, the big one is in gaming. So using, uh, for example, eye tracking and EEG to enhance different portions of the game that the game dynamic may actually change based off the EEG activity. Um, also, what's been very popular recently is in this lifestyle or meditation, allowing you to reach a, um, a different kind of state with the help of EEG and neurofeedback. So I would say over the last 10 to 20 years, while the majority of the research has focused on um, this restoring of lost capability, there is an, an attention being played to the healthy population. However, there are several key challenges that remain that prevent widespread use of these technologies. And the first one is just a general lack of robustness or the general uh, large amounts of variability that exists both within, uh, within an individual as well as across the population. So um, there's still lots of research into this area um, and nothing has really proven to be the 100% the solution. Also, uh, one of the key barriers is the need for subject-specific calibration for each of these subjects. So um, it's been reported in the literature that to get any of these systems to be at even 70 or 80 percent accurate, you need a recording session of 5 to 20 minutes before you can even start using the system in the first place. So if I told everybody that before you use your smartphone, you have to calibrate your screen, and it takes 10 to 15 minutes every time to do it, would any of us, any of us really use a smartphone in, to begin with? I think the answer is probably not. So these systems have to be sort of plug and go. Like once you get the technology, it has to work right away, and it has to be a very seamless transition, whereas a lot of the existing technologies have failed in that, in that aspect. And the obvious uh, issue is that what we expect of performance in a healthy population is going to be different. So no one would expect a healthy person to spell using the speller system or when they could just interact with the keyboard directly. Why would I use a technology if it doesn't actually help me do my job? And so this requires some thought about what are the systems that could be developed for healthy subjects. What do we want the technology to do, and how um, robust can we get these technologies to be? And so one of the prevalent uh, application domains in healthy populations for, um, for BCI technologies is in image search, sometimes called image triaging. So there exist many different domain areas where video or images are being recorded at a very large scale. For example, in YouTube, uh, a 2014 article says that over 300 hours of video is actually being recorded or uploaded every minute. So this is a large amount of data. Um, in this case, YouTube's interest, or Google's interest, rather, is um, in copyright infringement, for example. So when users upload content, um, if they're uploading infringing content, there has to be a, a mechanism for which to try to detect that that's an illegal upload. Um, in security or satellite imagery, it's at petabyte scale. So imagine like satellite imagery for security purposes or surveillance video. Um, this is also being recorded at very large amounts, 
of which the majority may not actually be of interest. Um, and I can pretty safely say that if you have 300 hours of video uploaded every minute, there's no way a human can actually look at all that, all that video. It's, it's just practically impossible. And so and there, there are other examples that I could use here. For example, in Facebook, um, there was a controversy several weeks ago about the uploading of a Pulitzer Prize winning photo from the Vietnam War. Uh, that was flagged as inappropriate content by Facebook and they, had, they got obviously news media to uh, criticize them for that. So the point of that is that fully automated solutions for to looking at either video or image have not completely solved these problems. So if it's questionable content on Facebook or questionable content on YouTube or searching of images for relevant information, this is still all domains where a fully automated solution on pure machine learning has not solved the, the issue. And so this presents an interesting use case for uh, neurotechnologies. So in, from the neuroscience literature, you can actually decode what's kind of called a novelty response. So if you're showing these images or videos to participants and they're looking for something that's questionable or something of interest, there's a response that you can decode from the EEG associated with this. And for those of you who are interested, this is called a P300 evoked potential. And so by its name, it's measured approximately 300 milliseconds after the content has been observed. And what's interesting here is that this speed of the neural response is actually faster than human reaction time. So if I were to see it and then press a button to say that's interesting, you can actually decode it faster from the EEG than from human response. And so this combination of like image and video searching together with neuroscience concepts was investigated by DARPA uh, in the mid to late 2000s um, in what was called the Cognitive Technology Threat Warning System. And so the goal was the classification of threats or interesting images or videos using a brain-computer interface. And so an example stimuli will look like this. So here, video sequences are being shown every half second. So uh, the presentation rate of two hertz means every 500 milliseconds there's a stimulus presented. Here, targets related to any like moving object, for example, a car or a person walking along, along the road. And so if you try to focus on and try to detect the next one, um, you may already think to yourself, hey, I saw one. It's like, no, I haven't seen it. Hey, I saw it. That kind of novelty response is or can be decoded from EEG. So there was one right there, um, one right there, maybe one right there. So, so this was an experiment that used uh, what's called the rapid serial visual presentation. That's exactly showing of an image at a pre-specified rate and having a person with the BCI scanning the database. And so this has been shown to be more effective than me just manually doing the, the search myself. So if I'm self-pacing the image display, I typically do it at a slower rate than two hertz. But the accuracy of the system has been shown to be really close to just me manually searching the database. However, this reduces a little bit of burden and stress on the user. They just have to focus, whereas if, on a manual search, you have to control the speed manually. And so they collected a, sub, a subject set of 18 people that performed this task. And so our current project, uh, so this, this DARPA project ended around 2010, 2011, and it was transitioned to Army Research to further uh, develop the technology. And so our current um, project is robust classification of the presence of a target from the EEG, but as I was saying before, trying to avoid this calibration period. Can we design a technology that just works right off the bat without needing any subject specific information and still attain a level of performance that's satisfactory. And so one of the promising avenues in this area is in non-Euclidean representations of the EEG signal. 
in particular uh, Ramanian geometry. So for those of you who may not know um, about non-Euclidean uh, geometries, um, it's actually relatively straightforward. So if you let X here be a segment of the EEG, it has C channels and T time points. So it's just a, a slice of the data. And you let the C be the covariance matrix, or actually it's a bad notation, I use C twice, sorry. Um, so if, given the segments, you calculate the covariance matrix on that segment. Um, covariance matrices are a special subset of semi-positive definite matrices. And from the literature, uh, the set of SPD matrices forms a non-Euclidean manifold or a differentiable manifold um, with an associated tangent space. So here, the shape of the data is not on an Euclidean surface. So the average of two uh, semi-positive definite matrices is not guaranteed to be another semi-positive definite matrix. So the assumption of an Euclidean space is is incorrect. Um, so what you can do is at a particular point C, uh, you can construct the tangent plane. The tangent plane is the Euclidean plane that intersects the surface at only one point. Um, so if you have two points on the manifold, uh, you can represent it either as a straight line on the tangent space or what you can call a geodesic on the manifold. It's the notion of the shortest path between two points on a non-Euclidean surface. And so you can either project to the tangent plane using an exponential mapping, or you can do the log mapping to go from the tangent space back down to the manifold. And so you can actually derive pretty efficient uh, metrics on the manifold in the special case of um, semi-positive definite matrices. Um, here you can define a distance between any two matrices as being a, Fer a Frobenius norm of the matrix product. So now given a notion of distance, you can now start talking about classification on the manifold as being, you just take the class means corresponding to your two, corresponding to your, your conditions of interest. So here, if targets classes were coded as plus one and non-targets were coded as minus one, you can actually just construct a simple classifier just to be the, uh, the minimum distance between the two class means and any given point uh, or, or any given EEG segment. And so this was shown a couple years ago to be really robust to subject differences as well as uh, individual trial variability. Um, we've extended this problem into a problem of crowdsourcing. Um, so if you have a, a database of subjects that have completed this task already, um, you can treat the problem of classifying the new subject as being a crowdsourcing problem. So how many basketball fans do we have in here? Anybody? Oh, don't be shy. You can. You can. <laughs> um, okay, maybe not much. So if I asked everybody, what are the chances that Golden State will win the NBA Finals this year? Who would say yes or who would say no to that? Let's say half or a third of you might go one way or the other. Um, so crowdsourcing is just a way for me to ask a population a question, get an answer from them, and then the goal is now how do I aggregate the potential answers from this crowd to form a better solution, a better aggregate solution at the end. You can treat it the EEG classification problem the same way. So if you have a test subject, you have that subject's associated EEG response, but you have a database of subjects who have also completed this task. And so each one is making a prediction about the content of the signal. Let's say this first subject's plus one, second one's minus one, and third one's plus one. So now you have a, multi a candidate set of predictions for this, for this segment of data. And so the question now becomes, how do you optimally combine predictions of independent classifiers? And so if you have some form of a priori information, this is actually a relatively simple problem. You can just use supervised learning. So of, let's say of the lot of you, let's say a few of you have correctly predicted the NBA Finals winner for the last 20 years. 
So in some sense, you're an expert. Like I should value your prediction more than others. Whereas someone like me might just be a coin flip because I don't watch too much of, of the game. So if you have some extra information like this expertise or a history of being correct, you can use supervised learning to construct an optimal combination. However, in practice, you typically don't know this ahead of time. And so in an unsupervised case where I don't really know any extra information, all I have is your predictions, how do I form an optimal combination? And so there was a really nice paper that came out a couple years ago that essentially talked about this. So given very minimal assumptions, uh, if you just give an M classifier, so just M people saying Golden State will win, Golden State will not win, uh, with their predictions F, if you just assume that their errors are uncorrelated, so that's really the only assumption you work with, uh, you can show that the optimal combination is actually just the sign of a weighted summation, where these, the, the weight value V is the lead eigenvector of the covariance matrix of the predictions. And so this represents a, a really nice, easy way to aggregate uh, a set of predictions to form a theoretically guaranteed optimal solution under these very loose assumptions. And so this approximation uh, gets better in the limit of the number of classifiers. So if you just had enough people predicting, you will get the optimal solution eventually. So depends on the application space. So in the uh, in the image search uh, that I the example that I gave earlier, typically the neural response is always observed within one second from the image presentation. So typically you just use one second segments all the time because you expect the neural the neural signature to be there. However, for other EEG activities, it could be variable length. Uh, but we've shown that this is relatively robust to the length of the segment that you work with. And so this combination of using a non-Euclidean uh, representation of the EEG to build a robust uh, EEG classifier combined with the crowdsourcing model was published by my postdoc, uh, Nick Wadowich, just a couple months ago. So this represents the first fully calibrationless BCI for image search in the literature. And so here we compared it to uh, several other competing algorithms. Um, so first off, the blue one is if you just calibrated the system with the subject's own data. So it starts off pretty poor because you don't have a lot of data. And it eventually gets pretty good given a large number of trials. Um, the purple is the algorithm that we just talked about, it was Ramanian geometric interpret or Ramanian geometric uh, analysis of EEG with the crowdsourcing uh, model. And so it, it's flat because it doesn't use any um, subject specific information in its classification. And so here it actually intersects right around, let's say 600 uh, trials. And, and at 600, the, the classifier built within the subject is better. Um, so this is an example of if I had a brand new subject, I sat him down and I wanted him to do a task, you can start right off the bat and do okay. Now the, the, the challenge is actually knowing when your own classifier is better than this subject independent one. This one is a, it's a little cheating because this assumes you know the labels for the data. So it's hard to actually do this without having the label knowledge. And so um, this is one of the uh, research questions that we have is building unsupervised classification models that are robust in the presence of subject differences. So this is uh, one of the examples of how we, how we want to try to use BCI technologies for healthy populations. Uh, the next couple of slides are just going to be sort of broad picture overviews of several other projects. Um, one of which is this concept of a human uh, AI team. So taking advantage of the fact that humans can perform a task pretty well, but they're not always reliable. For example, they get fatigued or, or they get drowsy. 
computer vision systems are very fast, but they don't always re they don't um, they aren't always robust. And so we've developed a system that is actually the joint uh, system between humans and computer vision. And so this uses a construct from or computational optimization. It's called the generalized assignment problem. So for those of you who know uh, from optimization theory, uh, it's more commonly referred to as the knapsack or the backpack problem. So if you have a backpack of a certain size and you have certain objects that you want to put in the backpack, how do you optimize the allocation subject to a cost or a constraint? So the generalized assignment problem is essentially the same thing. Given a set of agents, so an agent can be either a computer vision, could be a, a person using a BCI, or it could be just a manual labeler person. How do you optimally allocate the tasks? Here the task is to label an image. Um, how do you optimally combine the predictions of all the agents? And how do you do optimal reassignment of an image if the confidence is not correct? or if the confidence is not high enough. And so this is a closed loop system that's currently published as of a couple days ago and is on patent. So this is um, one of the technologies that we've developed. And our current, uh, our current research focuses on the large image databases uh, in terms of classification. So for those of you who are familiar with ImageNet, that's a database of 1,000 classes, about 14 million images. Uh, the Places 365 is a similar database of scenes. So instead of computer vision purely trying to make that prediction, can you have a human in the loop to improve the quality of that prediction? Um, another project is actually focused on the mitigation, mitigating the effects of what are called pilot-induced oscillations in aerial navigation. So before I get into this, it might be better to show the video. Um, so a pilot-induced oscillation is essentially a mismatch between the autonomy of the aircraft and the pilot. They're fighting for control of the aircraft, and, but there is a mismatch between what they're trying to do. So in this video, you're going to see a, a, a pilot trying to land. The autopilot's also going to try to land. However, the pilot tries to correct for a perceived error in the autopilot that causes an overcorrection from the autonomy, which then induces another overcorrection from the human. This produces an oscillation that can quickly grow catastrophic. Um, so here you're going to see the oscillation start, tries it to land, and then it eventually crashes. And will eventually actually spin out of control later and continue, um, uh, continue on its way. So here is, that's the oscillation. So the autonomy is trying to do the job of landing. However, the pilot perceives that it's not doing the correct thing. And so it causes this oscillation. This is not the worst case that I've seen. I've seen uh, <laughs> uh, the, the plane sp splitting in midair. The force of the, the control, the fight for control, causes the aircraft to split in half. And so this is a very serious problem for the Air Force because fighter pilots have to have control of the aircraft, but the autonomy is supposed to be there to help them do their job. So it's a mismatch between the integration of the pilot with the technology. And so in simulation, you can actually uh, induce a similar effect by a task that we call the boundary avoidance task. So here, subjects wear an Oculus Rift a virtual reality headset. Uh, they control a virtual aircraft through a joystick. The goal is to avoid the boundaries. You're essentially just flying through the rings. There's an autonomy that tries to help you with it, but the autonomy isn't always perfect. There's some errors uh, underlying the system. And so that's where the oscillation happens. Like, I think the plane should be going this way. The autonomy is telling me not to go that way. Um, this fighting between the two in some of our experiments has caused pilots to actually break the joystick. It's like they, they fight with it so hard that they break the joystick. And so in the neuroscience literature, you can actually point this phenomena uh, back to like task-induced arousal. So if you imagine yourself as a pilot of a multi-million dollar aircraft, 
you're highly aroused in the sense that I have to land or else I might die, <laughs> right? So there's, there's a lot of pressure to be focused and to always try to take control. And so that's not always the best solution, but when we tell pilots to let go, a lot of pilots will say no because they just don't trust the system. And so what we're trying to do with this project uh, is try to develop classification systems from the EEG that are markers of the sense of, I guess, distrust or the, um, the feedback negativity. So I perceive the system is not doing what I should, what I think it should be doing. There is a neural signature associated with that. Um, you can also measure this through pupillometry. So as people get highly aroused, their pupils dilate. And so this is tied to a particular um, neural circuit within the brain of arousal, the pupillometry, the EEG, and the perception of mismatch between my actions and the autonomy's actions. So this is a joint project with uh, Air Force Research Laboratory and Columbia University, and the paper was just published uh, a few months ago, detailing our initial efforts on a closed-loop classification system to mitigate the presence of pilot-induced oscillations. And so we also have some other experiments uh, related to driving. So uh, Army soldiers also drive a lot, and they're on, um, they're on patrol for a significant period of time. And so here we're interested in detecting a brain behavior interaction. Are there certain uh, brain activities that correlate to um, the behavior that's taken? And so in this task, uh, subjects drove along a relatively featureless highway. The goal is to keep yourself in the center of the lane. Uh, every now and then, there's other traffic that you have to avoid, and there's occasional wind gusts that push your car from one lane to the other. So the goal is to um, get back into the center of the lane. And so this, because this is a very boring task, this is about a two-hour recording that people do. So people get kind of tired, and their behavior starts to change. And so if you look at the EG signal and break the signal into its components, so the delta, the alpha, beta, uh, theta bands, you can actually use a causal inference to actually associate the behavior with the neural activity. And so what we found was the presence of two brain states, uh, reactive and proactive. So uh, if you just ignore the terms, uh, reactive is the behavior predicts the neural response, and proactive is the reverse. The neural response predicts the behavior. Um, interestingly, they occur in different frequency bands, and there's a positive uh, predictive value, positive predictions when using this feature to predict the brain state in, in reverse. So here, there's another video that I have. Right, so here uh, you have two different participants, uh, A and B. Um, here, the size of the circles that you're seeing denotes the strength of the relationship uh, between the two states. Um, the performance error is this lane deviation error. Like, you want to stay center, but there's forces that push you away. Um, and so you can clearly see that when there are certain errors that are being made, for example, these large spikes, that there is a shift in the underlying brain state. And so this is... Um, potentially useful for a closed loop system for autonomous driving, for example. If the system can determine that you're about to make a serious error, the system can sort of override your control to keep you, um, essentially to keep you safe. Um, interestingly, the, there's a general structure between these two subjects, although there are some uh, individual specific uh, features. However, However, uh, the, general, um, the general information stays the same. Yeah. And so 
Another project that we have undergoing um, might look a little silly is um, a serious games for BCI. So how many people play like Candy Crush or Bejewels or any sort of gem matching, spinning sort of games? <laughs> um, there's been news reports. Uh, I, I think King, the maker of Candy Crush, makes maybe $50 million a day just for people playing the game. So these are games that are highly addictive. People play them all the time. Um, but this also introduces a very nice platform for BCI research. So we've been, we are in the process of developing a, a game that could be played on a smartphone. Um, there are BCI tasks embedded within the game. So this provides like power-ups or special capabilities that allow you to play the game better. Um, we have a research protocol in place to record subjects of, let's say, about an hour a day for six months. Uh, subjects are paid to play the game. so. <laughs> um, but the idea is to look at this uh, variability question. So a lot of the current research that's being done is just within subject and typically over a very short time span. So a data re recording session might last only half an hour to an hour which that's a very limited amount of information to try to build a robust system. So the, the idea here is to try to model the long-term dependencies in the data. You, have, you may have some within session variability. You may have variability day-to-day -day as well as more long-term, so like week-to-week, month-to-month. Um, this is a, a challenge because this is a lot of data being recorded. There's a lot of events that are happening in the game. Um, but we feel that this is a a very nice uh, platform for doing long-term BCI research, which leads us into uh, what might be of interest to some people here is this uh, big data challenge. So the proliferation of neural networks and computer vision and speech and in text processing has enabled rapid technology growth in those areas. However, for neurotechnology or neuroscience, it's still relatively hard to collect a large amount of data. And so with our collaborators across the country and actually across the world, um, we have on hand data sets of over 1,000 subjects representing 2,000 different sessions. I believe this number is actually out of date. It's closer to 30, maybe even 40 terabytes in size. So this gives us a unique position within academia and within industry to actually start looking at this big data question. Can you learn novel um, pieces of information by doing a data mining approach on such a large scale data set. However, there's some challenges. Uh, all the data sets are slightly different. For, in particular, the research des or the, the design of the experiment, the organization, the structure, um, modality and size. So the, the question now is how can a common analysis be applied to all these different kinds of data sets when their st structure is inherently different? And so over the last couple of years, we've made significant strides on an ANSI standard or an industry standard for uh, using a common language to describe the data. So this is like an ontology that describes all the events that occur. This is the hierarchical event descriptors, the, AG, the head tags. Uh, the ESS is a file container. Think of it as just a, a file format that contains all the information in the experiment as well as standardized processing pipelines that push all the data collections onto a common representation. So you need all three of these together to st before you even start thinking about a data mining or data search uh, question. Each of these have papers associated with them, and I can send them out um, if anyone's interested. And so we don't always just look at EEG. We are interested in multimodality research. So for example, looking at eye tracking or heart rate variability, how does this multimodality data help me to design a better system? So this also requires uh, an engineering effort to synchronize all the different data streams together. So EEG might be recording at one specified frequency, eye tracking is at a different frequency, the heart rate's at a different frequency. A lot of the effort that we have is trying to align all the data sets together so that they're all aligned corresponding to time. So we've developed a uh, processing pipeline, the uh, LSL, uh, 
the lab streaming layer that synchronizes all the data streams as long as all the data types connect to a Wi-Fi network. So it provides the automatic synchronization, which allows you to store the data or to potentially visualize the data in real time. So these, these uh, sequence of steps, the efficient, oops, the, a common language to describe all the events in all your data sets, a common file format across every data set that you have, as well as them all being processed in exactly the same way, enables a big data approach that we're just now scratching the surface with. And so um, these tools have been open sourced. They're not restricted just to the Army. If anyone's interested, um, everything's fully available. Uh, the ESS is the, um, the event study schema. It's sort of a, like with most uh, data collections, it's like a Word document that describes what's the experiment. The ESS is essentially a standard way to describe your, your data. And so just, uh, that might have been a lot of information there, so I'm just gonna just do a broad summary. Um, where I work is in the human sciences research area, and our goals are, can be broadly summarized as three uh, different aims. One is to, how do you predict uh, dynamic behavior of individuals across uh, teams? How do you either directly or indirectly enhance individual human capabilities through, um, or across a broad range of scenarios? And how do you develop uh, fundamental principles for the integration of humans and systems with the goal of um, enhancing performance of human agent teams in cybersecurity and in or organizational social networks? So this is my shameless plug-in. Um, if anyone's interested in working in this area, um, feel free to contact me. We always have a few slots open for either PhDs or non-PhDs. Uh, we're always looking for uh, talented people in engineering. You do not need knowledge of neuroscience. That's something we can, uh, we can pick you up uh, from there. Um, but if anyone's interested, just feel free to contact me. And with that, that's all I had. So thanks for your time.